always active, and it turns out some cellular receptors are too, signaling even in the absence of an activating molecule, and activating what we call an agonist. And this complicates our traditional ideas about how these receptors work. So it was traditionally thought that you would have the receptor be kind of quiet until it bound to an agonist. So we call binding partners ligands, and an agonist is a ligand that when it binds, it activates the receptor, and so it increases the signaling, it increases the activity of the receptor. And an antagonist, it binds to the receptor and prevents the agonist from binding, and therefore it prevents it from being activated. But if you already have some baseline activity, you have this high constitutive activity, an antagonist isn't going to be able to prevent that. And so we need to introduce a third topic, inverse agonist. And an inverse agonist is actually going to be able to reduce that baseline activity, what we call this constitutive activity, this activity that's present in the absence of a signaling molecule. An inverse agonist is actually able to decrease that so you can get below that like baseline level, below what we call the basal activity activity level. And so let's discuss what all these terms mean as well as what's actually happening at the molecular level to explain this. How we can have different like proportions of the receptors be in active versus inactive conformations or like shapes. So receptors are how cells are able to convey messages from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell as well as there's other receptors that can or make the signals like into the nucleus and affect gene transcription, all this various stuff. But we're just going to talk about your dimensional receptor that is embedded in the surface of a cellular membrane. Basically, it goes through the membrane. One part is on the outside, so the extracellular side, we call it extracellular domain, or it's part. Um, and then the other part is inside the cytoplasmic domain. So the cytoplasm is just like the general thing here of the cell. And so the message is extracellular, and then you want to take that message and portray it, um, convey it downstream to get things to happen inside of the cell. And the way that this happens is basically the signaling molecule binds to the extracellular part of the receptor, causes what we call a conformational change, so basically a shape shift in the receptor. This shape shift is going to kind of ripple through the receptor, cause the change in the shape inside of the cell, the cytoplasmic part, and this is going to trigger a signaling cascade typically. These can be through things like G-coupled proteins, this can be through things like phosphorylation. Basically, this is interacting with other partners um, and allowing it to then pass on that signal. The, those binding molecules that this receptor responds to, we call the binding partners ligands. And now ligand is just this generic umbrella term that we can use to describe binding partners. So we can, we also talked about the other day, about how we can talk about the binding partners of enzymes, that these enzymes are going to modify as substrates. But in the case of receptors, what we're dealing with are terms like agonist, antagonist, and inverse agonist. And how we're differentiating how we're classifying them is based on how they affect the receptor. So an agonist is a ligand that is actually going to activate the receptor and cause it to do that signaling. And an antagonist is going to compete for, with the agonist for that site, typically, um, and then prevents it from being activated. And so in this way, it's able to prevent the activation and if the receptor had no activity on its own, well, then you wouldn't get any activity. And so this is the traditional sense. This has been the traditional idea. So for example, you have um, caffeine, which binds to adenosine receptors. And so this is adenosine and it's part of like ATP, but it also acts as a signaling molecule and it binds to these receptors called adenosine receptors. And it causes a bunch of downstream um, signaling stuff, um, a bunch of neuroscience. I'm not a neuroscientist, so I'm not going to try to go into it. But basically, you get drowsy. Now, caffeine it is oh, and so then we call it adenosine agonist because it's activating this. Now, caffeine it looks pretty well adenosine, and it's going to bind to those adenosine receptors, but it's not going to activate them. It, um, and so it's going to block its activation, and therefore the receptor is going to be inactive and so you won't get as drowsy. But now say that your receptor actually is active in the absence of a ligand. And this has become increasingly um, like known that this is actually a thing. 
And it can be especially an issue if you are like overexpressing the receptor. So if you're trying to study it in a lab and you express a lot of it, so basically you put a lot of this receptor into the surface of cells, um, this can be even more of an issue. Um, having this activation, having some, some activity all the time, although it's also an, a problem or not a problem, but it's also um, happens in like wild type, just in like normal cells, as well as there are mutations that can cause diseases like cancer by making it so that these receptors are more active normally. So when we talk about how like normally active they are, um, in the absence of a ligand, we call this constitutive activity. So constitutive means the activity in the absence of any sort of like activating signal or any sort of repressing signal. This is just kind of like what it what its baseline is. And speaking of baseline, we can talk about this baseline or kind of like default activity as basal activity. So we use these words constitutive and basal. Um, and sometimes we use them kind of interchangeably, but we talk about like the basal activity levels and like the constitutive activity and these sorts of things. And this is all happening in the absence of a ligand. And so why would this be? Why would the receptor be active without a ligand present? Well, the, now the thinking is that these receptors can kind of be in an active and an inactive conformation. So remember conformation are inside those shapes. So it can be one of these like active shapes or one of these inactive shapes. And which it's in is going to depend on a few things, but you're going to have different proportions of the receptor being the active and inactive states. And basically the overall activity you see is going to depend on which proportion of the receptors are in each of these states. Now this is assuming that you have like an equal amount of the receptors. If you have more of the receptors, you're gonna get more activity, even if there's still a lot of them that are inactive. And um, you can have like different activities, different cell types, and there's a bunch of complicating factors. But if you were to take, do, try to look at apples to apples in comparisons, so the same cell types, same um, numbers of receptors, if you have, um, like, what would the activity levels be like in these different cells without a ligand? So what is the basal activity like? Well, that's going to depend on the, like, makeup of the receptor. So height of, like, how flexible it is and how, how, like, it's inherent tendency to be in an inactive shape or an active shape. Then when you introduce a ligand, now you are kind of, so if you have a receptor, so some receptors barely have like any constitutive activity. So they have really low basal activity. Most of it's going to be an inactive form. Whereas others have high basal activity. So they're going to have a lot of receptors in the active form, even in the absence of a ligand. So these receptors, these ones are gonna be pretty quiet with, when you don't like um, add an agonist, but these are going to have some activity without an agonist. Now, with either of these, you can, you can change the proportions of the receptors that are in each state by adding a ligand. And the type of ligand that you add is going to um, alter what proportion of the receptors are in each of these states. So if you add an agonist, remember that's one of our activating it's going to basically stabilize the receptor in this active state. And so remember the receptors can be going back and forth between this inactive state and the active state. And if the agonist is stabilizing the active state, now you're going to end up with more of the receptors, a higher proportion of receptors in the active state. And if you have more receptors in the active state, you're going to have more activity than you would have at that baseline. So if you were to look at our activity, if we were to add an agonist, would be stabilizing the active state, having a higher proportion of the agonist of the receptors in the active state, and we're going to get increased activity above this basal activity level, which is what we get with just the constitutive activity. So some agonists basically take you all the way to full activity, and some agonists are partial agonists, so they only go like partway. Um, but the agonist is taking you above that basal activity level because it's stabilizing the um, the active state. Now, what about an inverse agonist? An inverse agonist is going to stabilize the inactive state. So it's going to, by this way, it's going to stabilize it in this below default state. So you have more of it in the inactive state than you would in just at default, like than you would at just the constitutive level. And so you're actually what's going to happen is you're going to get activity below the basal activity level. And so this can be 
depending on how strong the inverse agonist is, you can get like um, way below or partially below um, the partial or full inverse agonist. Um, but basically you're getting below the basal activity level because you're decreasing the proportion that's in the active state. Um, and remember that was the proportion that was in the active state just because of the actual like makeup of the, of the receptor. Okay, and so what about antagonists though? Remember those are kind of like our conventional things. We were, we were essentially thinking you just have like these agonists and antagonists. Well, the antagonists, they, so they're going to bind and they're going to prevent the agonists from getting activated. They're going to bind to that binding site and actually block it from getting activated. So they're competing for that with the agonist. But it, remember how we had some of the, the active, even the absence of agonist. So if the antagonist, if all it's doing is blocking the agonist, it's not going to decrease the baseline activity level. Um, instead, it's basically just going to keep things at that basal activity, at that level where you just have the constitutive activity level. It's basically, it's not changing the proportions that are in the active or inactive. And so you don't get a change in the activity level from what we would have if you didn't have any ligand present. Now, if you had ligand, if you had the agonist present, however, now you are able to decrease the activity. So you can decrease the activity below the basal level, below the constitutive activity level, but you can decrease it below the like activated level. And this is because remember the activated level is above that baseline and the antagonist is going to be preventing the agonist from binding. So it's going to be preventing the activation is going to be preventing it from getting above. And so the more of this antagonist you add, the more you're able to basically compete out the, the antagonist and therefore compete out the agonist, sorry, and therefore you're able to take it to baseline. And if you have a inverse agonist, well, remember now this, it was able to go below baseline. So it was still able to go below baseline. And the amount of basically how much you're reducing the activity it doesn't just depend on the ligand, it also depends on how much of it you have. So if these are all just competing for that same binding site, well now if you have enough of, if you add enough of the agonist, you will be able to overcome the effects. Um, whereas um, assuming that these are all being like competitive inhibitors, they're actually binding to that active site, they're being um, um, okay, and so what, what's this deal with this partial agonist? So partial agonist, remember, that's something that can like bind, but it can't fully activate the receptors. And so if you have a partial agonist, if you don't have any receptor, if you don't have any ligand present, well, you're going to get an increase in activity. It's not as much as you would get with a full agonist. But if you had a full agonist present and now you add a partial agonist, they're competing for that same site, but the partial agonist can't activate it as much. And so you get a decrease in activity, um, but you're still going to be above that basal level, above the baseline. An antagonist would take you to the baseline and an inverse agonist would take you below the baseline. Um, and so this is the basic idea with how this is what's actually happening when you add these different binding partners to to receptors. And this is an important concept because it, these binding partners, these ligands, these agonists, these antagonists, these inverse agonists, they make important pharmaceutical compounds as well as like recreational drugs. These are all, a lot of these um, drugs are acting on receptors because receptors are how the cells are communicating, how they're sending messages. And they're also the, like the first thing that these drugs are going to see when they go into the body because they're on the outs, the receptors are remember on like through the membrane of the cells. So when that, when that compound is entering the body, it's going to be able to kind of like see those receptors and bind to them. Um, and then if you have an excess of signaling, we might want to decrease the signaling. Um, and so we would add an antagonist if you want to block it from being activated um, or an inverse agonist if you want to actually reduce it below the baseline, but maybe you don't want to reduce it below the baseline because you still need some of that signaling, right? But what if you have something that is like, has a high constitutive activity because of a mutation? So you can have mutations in these receptors that cause them to be, have a higher baseline activity, have a higher constitutive activity, higher activity levels, 
in the absence of the agonists. So they're kind of like have a higher constitutive activity because of the mutation that makes it so that it stabilizes the active state more. Um, and in these cases, then they do want to reduce that, um, that constitutive activity level and then something like an inverse agonist um, would, be, would be called for. We can describe ligands as being endogenous, so made by the body, or exogenous, so taken in from outside. So for example, adenosine. When the adenosine that our bodies make and use to bind to these receptors, that would be endogenous, but this can also be given exogenously, so doctors can give adenosine to patients in order to like slow down their heart rate. We can also, so that would be exogenous, but it's still kind of like the body's natural, it can make it so that you can have this thing be endogenous if the person's making it themselves or exogenous if it's, if it's given out from outside. You can also have things that are like always exogenous, like caffeine, like our bodies can't make caffeine, and so, but we can take it from outside, um, and so this would be exogenous. Um, and you can also have exogenous things that aren't even natural pro um, products, but that are like pharmaceutical drugs that have been designed. Um, and so so basically these receptors, although they have binding sites that may be specialized in the thing that they're kind of like made for, like adenosine receptor, adenosine, but it can also bind to other things. And so there's some sort of flexibility in the binding pocket, although different receptors are going to have um, different preferences for what they're binding. And this is why different receptors can respond to different signals. And then because those receptors respond differently and they're attached to different things on the inside, you get different responses. Um, and there's also, because this is a fairly new concept, there's a lot of um, cases where it's not quite known whether things act as an antagonist or as an inverse agonist. Um, and there's a lot of research being done. Um, and at the end of the day, some of this is all just terminology. And what really matters is the effects that it's going to have. Um, and those effects too are going to be, um, depend on the conditions around the of like the receptors are in. So how many receptors are there? How tightly do these things bind? Um, what's the pH like? What, what's on the inside to respond to the signal? What's on the outside to send the signal? It might get complicated pretty fast, but this is the basic idea where you have antagonists, agonists, and inverse agonists are all types of ligands. So binding partners for receptors um, and they're typically all binding to the same spot and thus competing. And which one wins is going to dictate um, what proportion of the receptors are going to be in an inactive or active state, and therefore how much signaling you get. If you have an agonist, you're going to get mostly in the active state, and you're going to get a lot of signaling. If you have an antagonist, the active state is going to be blocked. So you're only going to get like the inference, this like, default level of activity. Um, this basal or constitutive activity. And if you have an inverse activeness, it's going to stabilize the inactive form, and therefore you're going to get less activity than you would even at that baseline. Um, and that is the basics of these receptors and their binding partners, and hope this helps.